I'll pass it over to Martin. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, good. Yes, thank you. Thank you, bienvenue, uh, bonjour, and welcome to our 30th and counting democracy forum, where we try to do democracy differently and, and more democratically. Now, what do I mean by that, more democratically? If we were all progressives, everyone in this room on this campus, or progressive conservative, as his government calls itself, we wouldn't need elections or democracy because we would all be thinking the same thoughts. We wouldn't need a democracy forum. It would all be preordained. The great thing about the politician sitting beside me is that we agree on almost nothing, mm -hmm. but we tend to agree <laughs> and debate in a democratic way. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you about our guest. Stephen Lecce has been Minister of Education since 2019 for Ontario's progressive conservative government. In fact, he was the youngest ever to hold the job at age 31. Correct? Like, uh, appointed at 32, elected 32. at 31. See. Elected at 31. Mm -hmm. Why don't we fact check? Yes. I give him a chance to catch me out on getting things wrong. Star here. He was already a political veteran, however, uh, because he, uh, he was actually elected a decade before that when he ran for president of the student council at Western, that other university. Mm -hmm. Now, his platform called for free hot water in the student lounge. Yes. And he Who's, promised it, to protect the environment. Wait, I have charging hot water. This is I have to introduce okay, you that. I'm sorry. That's You're out of order. OK. Um, he promised to protect the environment. That's what he's trying to talk over. And he won in a landslide. Now, almost a decade before that, he was, he was already a political veteran even then. At age 13, he, he volunteered to work on his first provincial election campaign, and they won. Now, after graduating, he went straight to the prime minister's office, rising to become Stephen Harper's director of communications. His parents were not pleased. Mm. They wanted him to stay in school and study law. First rule of politics is you cannot please everybody, not even mom and dad, right? Apparently, yeah. So beyond student politics and federal politics and provincial politics, more seriously, he's also served as an international election observer. After the Arab Spring, he traveled to Tunisia for the first fully democratic, fully free and fair democratic elections in 2014. So he's a partisan. But he's also passionate about democracy, as am I. So welcome to the Democracy Forum. At Thank you. Um, I'd also like to welcome Patrice Barnes, uh, who is the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education and the MPP for Ajax. Sitting over there. Thank you, also deputy speaker in the legislature, so you can help me if he is out of order at any point. Okay, first a bit of housekeeping. I'll kick it off with my questions and then we'll open it up to the audience, students in particular, a little later on. I always remind people, because expectations are everything in politics as in the movies, that this is not a news conference, it's not actually a debate. It is a, a democracy forum where we try to dig in a little deeper and try to get more insightful answers, no pressure. Uh, so it's not a confrontation, it's a chance to actually exchange ideas. We don't interrupt, we don't disrupt, and that's what everyone in this room signed up for. I have to remind everybody in the times we live in that you registered, you agreed to our code of conduct, and our enforcer is your professor, Kareem Bardizi. Sorry, there you are. <coughs> okay, I'd like to talk a little bit first about your journey in politics, then we'll zoom out a little bit to the state of democracy in this province and country and around the world. Sure. Uh, and then we'll talk about your job as minister. Uh, just a reminder to the audience before you jump, he is not the minister responsible for post-secondary education. That's Jill Dunlop, colleges and universities, tougher job. Your job is pretty tough. Kindergarten to grade 12. And the problem is that everyone in this room knows a lot about K to 12. Yes. They've just been there. Uh, so the they- best focus group. Yeah, they are, they are qualified, as am I, as the parent of two kids at university right now who have also gone through the system. So um, first question that I ask, it's a trick question that I ask every progressive conservative or conservative cabinet minister, and we've had a few, or premier. And that is, why did you become a conservative? Mm -hmm. and, and how did you know when you were 13 years old that you were a conservative? So first off, it's amazing to be with you. I've not really had the opportunity to speak to many students like this. Uh, so thank you to the Democracy Forum. Thank you to TMU. 
uh, and to the professor for welcoming us. We do, I do appreciate it. Um, and the sort of uh, the, the best person in our education portfolio is Patrice Barnes, who serves as the first black deputy speaker in Ontario's legislative history. It's an honor to work with her, former school board trustee and a parent, and someone who has skin in the game herself. Um, important question, because I didn't come from a political background. My, my parents were, uh, are immigrants from Italy. They came here in a boat post-war. So you can imagine my father uh, approaching Ellis Island in New York, literally seeing the Statue of Liberty uh, in the horizon. My mother came through Halifax through Pier 21. So I wasn't raised in a political experience. We didn't really talk politics at the table. But intrinsically, I thought many immigrant values overlap or align with progressive conservative values. Uh, the fundamental values my parents raised me with were to work hard, to be productive, law-abiding, to love my family and be proud of my country. And I think those are fundamentally values that I subscribe to today. They are modern conservative values. And I find a lot of new Canadians, like my own grandparents, couldn't have imagined voting for the blue guys because, you know, uh, for many, the heritage of many immigrant communities, Italians among many others, Pierre Trudeau was sort of the, um, uh, a, 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 an idolized person. Of course, uh, my, my, my family came under Diefenbaker, ironically, but, we, but they attributed it to, uh, to the guy that came some years later. So my point in short is um, understanding that those value systems really did align with my own today. And my parents, while they were confused a bit, like why does my son want to go knock on doors in a campaign versus going to do what any other normal 13 or 14 year old does, um, I think what I realized is I was able to discover a vocation, not just a hobby. And some of you will have the benefit of sort of figuring, seeing that spark. It may happen younger, it may happen later. I, I know people who ran much later in their life and they found this amazing opportunity to really contribute to our democracy or civil discourse. But for me, my conservatives are underpinned by my, fam my values of my family um, and my pride in country. And I think those aren't universal to conservative values, but I think that they do underscore my why of why I decided at the tender old age of 31, uh, to seek a nomination, get elected, and then a year later to get appointed to cabinet. Okay, but uh, what I don't get is, I mean, I'm the child of immigrants too, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to disclose who I vote for in public, but let's just say maybe I chose a different yeah, you know, course. Yeah, we can so, surmise that. So, so what, did you, what did you learn in student politics more seriously? Because sure. there are people here who might be thinking about student politics for the moment and other politics later. What did you learn then uh, when you campaigned for water, hot water and the environment that that stuck with you. And I, I made a note to myself that, that I, I spoke at a panel a, a few weeks ago um, for university professors, uh, faculty associations. And I met the union president, Professor Narain. Mm -hmm. ring a bell? Who said he taught you? Maybe you've forgotten him. He said he taught you at Western. Okay. And, that, and that he sends his regards okay. and, and, and says he has no regrets, but your proof that professors don't, in fact, indoctrinate students, as, which is what people, <laughs> what people say today. So for what did you learn? What did you learn? great effort, I would say, but... but um, student politics. Yeah, I think... Thank you guys. Okay, thanks guys. We're, we're in a classroom setting here, guys. Thanks. Thanks okay. guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that, setting, that this, this is, is actually a classroom. A classroom. classroom. This is a classroom. This is a classroom. And, classroom. And I'm seeing I'm seeing the hammer and sickle yeah, here from the workers' out. party. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're a registered class, if you're registered in this class, we're welcome. You're okay, guys. Okay. I see the hammer and sickle, point. and are you hearing free Palestine? You've made your point. We're now in a classroom setting. So can you please leave? Why don't you try to have your own rally? Why don't you hold your own rally? Hold your own rally. See what, see what kind of crowd you can get. It's a democratic country. Hold your own rally. Thanks. OK. Thank you. Let's, um, so it's democracy. Um, I would extend a welcome to them as well, to the democracy forum, but they weren't really listening. OK, so let's, let's talk about Let's talk about democracy, okay. and, and um, I want to know also what you learned. You went to Tunisia in 2014, so I'd be in there mm -hmm. um, before that as a foreign correspondent and saw 
the elections, so-called elections, a few years before that, which were not free and fair. It is actually a, a kind of picture postcard police state, mm -hmm. and uh, the elections were a sham. Uh, the opposition leaders that I interviewed from all parties, far left, as we just heard, or far right, ended up in jail later. So when you were there in 2014, what did mm -hmm. you see, and what, what lessons did you come away with? I think first off, we just have to be so grateful as Canadians uh, to appreciate that we live in a country where that is possible. Uh, where there are many nations, and by many nations, I mean the overwhelming majority of people will live in a place where free speech, uh, political association, uh, and free press are entirely denied. So it is a strength, even if it, you know, uh, unpleasant, it, it is important that we appreciate that that is a truth. And we should be very blessed to live in a country where that type of freedom is permitted and encouraged. Um, in Tunisia, though, Remember the context. There was an uprising that actually emanated in Tunisia within that region. The Arab Spring. The Arab Spring. Um, and when I went there, I went there under the guise of with a multi-partisan mission of Canadians, Americans, people from Britain, pretty much the entire West with a solitary mission, which is to help build the capacity of, um, of this new, somewhat transitioning country into a democratic function. And I remember in the first time, I went there twice uh, for different purposes, but the first time I went, I remember seeing and working with uh, new political party aspirants, people who are running. Mm -hmm. Remember, these are people who've never debated, never been in a, in a television commercial, never really been able to do this because this is not permitted in a dictatorial regime. They don't have the tradecraft yet of organizing, political organizing, all no those No infrastructure, no basic infrastructure, no ecosystem to permit it. So I remember working with men and women uh, and young people as well who were trying to build capacity. And my constant refrain was that sense of the overwhelming sense of privilege as a Canadian to be able to go abroad and help to promote fundamental values of freedom of, and human dignity and democracy. Um, and the people I met there were so grateful because they long for freedom. Uh, you know, people around the world who are systematically oppressed by governments, dictators, uh, their rulers, um, we have the same aspiration for everyone, which is creating the opportunity for an individual to be, to pursue good jobs, economic dignity, and to live in a land of freedom. That is not the case for many. So when I was in Tunisia, that, that was where it really, sort of that spark lit about democracy the pride I have in our country and what the Canadian flag stood for in North Africa and other parts of the world where people saw us as a beacon of freedom and a beacon of opportunity for different people from every walk of life, every faith, every heritage to come together with some sense of social cohesion, some sense of unity of purpose. Okay, but when you come back here, as I did after 11 years, mm -hmm. and you see that people are willing to die for democracy and, and you know, facing bullets in, in the pursuit of ballots, then you come back here and there is indifference to democracy, which is hard to take. So, so how, do you re how do you reconcile what you saw and brought in and how precious democracy can be, even with all the, the, the fighting that, that is involved here at home, because mm -hmm. it can be a blood sport. Um, how, do you, how do you reconcile that with the indifference and, and apathy that you so often see here? And the example that in the last election, the electoral turnout was the lowest level Ever. Any, anyone here know what the number was? It was like 43.5% turned out for the Who here voted in the last election, by the way? Okay, it's a majority, it looks like. I call a majority. Um, so how do you reconcile that, that, um, that inspiration you might have drawn from Tunisia with what you see here as the challenge of, of, get, of democratic engagement? And that was a very high proportion because when you look at the data in the 2021 federal election, people who are over the age 65 to 75 uh, the demographic of, uh, demographic of 18 to 24, there was almost a 30% voting differential of yep. these uh, sort of elder voting at a higher rate. So this is disproportionate and you're doing something right at TMU. But um, I like to say that young people want to change the world, but don't vote. Maybe everyone here in this classroom doesn't, so you're atypical, bless you. Yes. But old folks uh, who may not want to change the world anymore, vote, so. Yeah, and I just think that that's a, an important starting point. Um, just the recognition that we do have higher, lower rates of youth engagement in democracy, which is a threat, but an opportunity to, we can discuss. But for the purpose of that contrast, for me, I felt a great sense um, 
frankly, it even remains true today when you see such low rates of civic engagement and you know you've seen people long for fundamental freedoms. You've seen people abroad, you know, protest, petition, do whatever they could within the reality of their democratic system, often limited, and I'm being very gentle in how they could operate. It was frustrating for me because I think there's an element of a disconnect um, we have people in this country who, you know, we have the rule of law, constitution, charter of rights and freedoms, we have the bill of rights that preceded that. We have, we have protections that safeguard us. And there are people abroad who have no basic standards of, um, of liberty or, or really citizenship. And so I think for us, it's almost like the greatest exercise for a Canadian to realize how privileged we are to be Canadian is to leave the country. And to go to one of these nations for which there are plenty, sadly, there are many at least north, you know, east and west of us where you can choose a place where that democratic expression is not the norm. And for me, it was my why. It's what sort of has in a big significant way um, inspired me to be an agent of change and someone who, you know, even if we disagree ideologically in this room, which is okay in a democracy, to hope that other young people, including those who may not agree with me, feel the sense um, feel that they can build a critical path. They can build, um, you know, um, uh, set out goals for yourselves to get nominated, elected, and even appointed into cabinet. That is achievable for every single one of you. It just really, it doesn't matter your party, your persuasion, I don't care, it's immaterial. It's just the idea that young people and governments need to be more reflective of its, rep of its people. And uh, when I went abroad, I realized that we have a lot to fight for in this country, we have a lot to safeguard, a lot to sort of protect, and we have skin in the game. The level of apathy is also drawn from the sense of young people's belief that they're not reflected within their government. Okay, but let, let's, let's, let's unpack that. So sure. you are, your day job now, Minister of Education. So, mm -hmm. so we've had previous guests at the Democracy Forum. We have all the four major party leaders and the premier at our first one in 2018. We've had Lieutenant Governor uh, also at our forum, focusing on the challenge of civics, of yes. civics education. We have some experts in the room, the focus group, as you call it. Mm. Uh, it's grade 10, I guess. And tell us what you've done and what you can. I know there might be more questions on this later, but, but how are you going to measure success? You've, you've made some changes to the curriculum. How's it working? And can we judge you in the next election? I know it's not a direct correlation between what you teach and what the outcomes are, but what are you doing as minister sure. to help? Well, I think um, first and foremost is we're making the civics and career courses, which are two, <coughs> excuse me, two half courses taken in grade 10, as you mentioned, relevant. So we modernize. I mean, look, is it fair to say for most of you that civics and careers was a bird course? You showed up, you did the minimum, and you got like a 75 to 80%? Tell me if I'm wrong. So that's your experience, that was mine, and we're of a different generation generally, and it's the same is true, which sort of, it goes back to the point. What was the point of civics? It wasn't meant to just sort of, it wasn't a spare. It wasn't designed to be a social experience. Uh, it was really designed to get young people motivated and interested in democracy, in their government, and to understand how to navigate government, how to advance policies and priorities, and also to understand machinery of government and, and how our systems uh, work. What I noticed in the civics course is that it was so heavily doused in theory mm -hmm. and a lack of relevant application for young people on how to be the agent of change. It's, it's important to know how uh, a bill is passed upon royal assent, and that's really exciting to some people like you uh, or I, uh, or I. Uh, but like, that is interesting, but I'm not, I wouldn't so, so submit that's the metric of, of our success because it's not usable knowledge. I'm frustrated with this across the curriculum, frankly. So we've modernized the civics course a year ago. We did the same thing with, with uh, or just over a year ago and the, and the careers course to really make it relevant to what young people we believe need to know. And one component that is relevant, I wouldn't say it's new, but it has emerged again. It's just the rise of disinformation, misinformation, and the advent of social media, which frankly, when I was in school, and I'm not, you know, as you know, noted, I'm not certainly the oldest guy in politics, but, and, and I may be the youngest Minister of Education, but even still, I didn't have to face yeah. with this reality where there was literally, um, uh, there was inaccurate information, to put it gently and politely, being, uh, uh, being shared online and disseminated and almost being accepted today as fact. You know, there's a really interesting poll I saw where it suggested that around 25% of young people have confidence, more confidence 
in data that comes from social media, because if it's from a Facebook or something that they trust, even though the, the entity that's sharing it isn't creating the news or fact-checking the news, they're just sort of a platform, an intermediary between the news source and the public, somehow, you know, you've got the, the corporate brand there, you see the article or see this sort of faux article and, you, and people believe it. Young people have higher rates of, of confidence. So I wanted to give young people some usable tools, students about how to understand sourcing and how to be a critical thinker. So that yes, we're contrary to my wonderful former professor, students are not taught what to think, but how to think yeah, critically, which exactly. is foundational in the new civics course. You wanna make them think. So, so one of the civics courses, you come into the legislature and you watch the politicians performing in front of you, allegedly debating, but performing. And I imagine as education minister, you're always squirming when you watch the, worst theater in the children okay, above yeah, watching so. the children uh, uh, on the floor. Yes. I remember when my daughter went, someone was one of your, one of your members in your caucus was, was questioning the theory of evolution that she had just learned in school. He's no longer part of your caucus. Yes, he's not a member of caucus, fairness. but thank you, yes. So, so let's, let's just shift gears for a second though. So, so we think of, of, of politics as a sort of blood sport, but yeah. we have a mayor now who was our last guest on the Democracy Forum. I'm always plugging the Democracy Forum and you're always welcome, but Olivia Chow was on yep. Uh, yep. last time. And what's interesting about her as a, as a longtime lifelong new Democrat is how she is doing business with the progressive conservative premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, whom a lot of many of her supporters would vilify and vice versa. So how do politicians I watch you in the legislature where you're, right. you're making fun of new Democrats and liberals, and yet your government is working with an NDP mayor and the mm -hmm. federal liberals have been your partner on a lot, of, a lot of issues as well. So how do you change gears when you're doing all this theater? Well, look, I would argue, I mean, uh, I would say as a first principle, it actually is a material strength as a Canadian. I'll go back to my sort of overarching premise, which is proud to be Canadian, proud of Canadian values. We need to promote more of them in our school system and in our society. But you use a case study that I actually think builds, uh, it validates my narrative today or my thesis today, which is we live in a pretty amazing democracy where people of different political persuasions who have been sworn political enemies, maybe, uh, you know, I, I know that the premier historically had very strong words to say about Justin Trudeau when he was running to be prime minister. There's, and Olivia you've Chow. seen the commercials of it. And Olivia Chow back in the day. Um, and look, you know, that's okay uh, in the campaign hustlings to, to, to disagree. That's fine. I mean, even you know, in our democracy, in our parliament, there's tons of heckling and all this. And then meanwhile, we go and grab a coffee together afterwards. So a lot of it is, you know, in the theater of that moment in that space. But I'd argue, I want to harness the example you provided: a lifelong New Democrat uh, who has very little, I probably argue, in personality or ideology in common with our premier, maybe even our prime minister, yep. one could argue, but certainly the premier. Uh, they built a relationship on trust, mutual interests, and the public good. You know, I may not be a cheerleader for sort of center left politics and municipal government. I'm certainly not, or in school boards or anywhere else for that matter, but I can see it as a strength in our society, in our democracy, that people who have disparate values can sit in a room, dialogue, and find ways in common ground. And they were able to both deliver material wins for different constituencies, part of this sort of new deal for Toronto. Look at the, look during the pandemic. I mean, the premier worked collaboratively with the prime minister. I mean, I believe in part, he was electorally, he was rewarded for that, yeah. I think. I mean, you could disagree with the premier or the party or me or whatever, but at the end of the day, most people in this province, and I mean, the, you know, a healthy number, said that the government did a good job because they worked with the liberal prime minister working with the progressive conservative premier. And that may be difficult for partisans to understand, but I think most Canadians don't see themselves through the world of hyphenated, hyper-partisan politics. They just want government to work together for the public good. In a crisis, the premier demonstrated that leadership. And I thought that was counterintuitive and a strength. And it demonstrates, we look at the, look in the south of the border where you see so much division, even in the current primary system, that's not possible. It's not a virtue to work across party lines in many political systems around us, particularly to the south of us. I mean, even just dialoguing with someone on the other side could be seen as a, uh, as a vice. And here we have leaders standing beside each other, literally, maybe not hugging, but like, like holding, you know, being, able, being prepared to stand together um, with a common aim. And that was to do what was right in that moment. And I do think that's something not, you know, it doesn't have to happen every day, but when it happens, it could be impactful. I actually think it reflects what people want government to be 
which is collaborative and servicing their interests, not parties single or self. And I, and I see that a lot, and I think people don't realize how much of it is really theater. Oh, let's, let's go back to the classroom and, and, and talk about when that kind of political pluralism doesn't work. One of, one of the initiatives that you have pushed mm -hmm. to, in fact, are to talk about um, the Holodomor, the Ukrainian Holodomor, and the Holocaust. Um, the uh, Ontario was the first province. Uh, the Holodomor, of course, resulted in 4 million deaths in Ukraine. The Holocaust, 6 million Jews, and also right. many uh, LGBTQ plus and communists, including our friends who had the hammer and sickle a few moments ago. Yes. So, so um, why is this important to you? Why did you focus on the, on the Holodomor and the Holocaust? I understand you're also trying to, trying to you've offered that curriculum to other provinces yes. in Canada because you're, I think you're the national chair this year am, yeah. for, for provincial education ministers. It's a provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. the, the NDP government in BC has adopted this uh, in some form. So what was the inspiration and, and what was the, what, why was it so necessary? Right. I think civic education and history are actually really important ways we safeguard our democracy and our future. I think there's a profound level of lack of engagement or knowledge about sacrifices of the past and the values that I think have underpinned Canada and Canadians for generations. And so the whole, the more, uh, the Holocaust, these are, are, are brutal examples of political extremes and one on the far left of, you know, of Marxist co communism, the other side being fascism, but frankly, no matter where those extremes land. Anti-democratic. They certainly undermine our democratic character and you're being gentle and kind, but yes, um, they do. And so I believe that young people, the more we can educate students about the perils of extreme political ideology on the far right, far left is a healthy thing for our country. And those case studies are among some of the darkest moments in human history where governments, in some cases elected by their peers, could have been persuaded to be bystanders and to believe in an extreme ideology of literally systematic death for so many people. And so, you know, the Haldemar literally means the great famine. And I mean, the idea that like millions and millions of people died and no one knew because the USSR, the Soviet Union at the time, suppressed any freedom uh, and dissemination of information. So it took time for the world to really understand the profound horror of of, um, of, of this oppression. And so I just believe the more we can educate and emancipate those fundamental values of freedom, of democracy, human rights, the rule of law, if we can ensure young people enshrine in their hearts and minds that those are you know, sort of our red line, that we're gonna defend against that. Because we've, we don't have to go back like you know, 1900 years ago in a far off land, like this happened, our grandparents, yep. for many of you, maybe it could have been your grandma, maybe great grandparents, depending on age, but like our grandparents, live this like we can still touch and feel the survivors you know and i mean yet, many of them the are... denialism is encroaching right that's that's one of the things you're worried about is that people aren't actually it is seized of it because i think what offends so many you know i speak to people of different experiences the sense of it is it, first of all the intergenerational trauma that happens with any community that has oppressed this, that have been oppressed and face this type of uh, of um of savage butchery comes with its own challenges. I think what makes it so much more difficult is to is the normalize the attempt to normalize um, uh, to normalize um, denialism. How and I, you, and I, I think, if I may, I would just say I, I do believe that this rise, in part predicated on the rise of social media misinformation, and then just fact-free social media commentary and sort of streaming consciousness of everyone online, you know, we're in a world where that's becoming normalized. And I just feel like as a Canadian, as a politician, as a public servant, as someone who chose at an earlier point of my life that I want to get into, get into this enterprise of government, I think that is, if you said, one of the most existential threats on the horizon of a country. It's that if we don't have civically engaged people who are motivated to stand up when the other person is oppressed or the other person in their community, in their family, in their neighborhood, um, because we've all, many of us have been othered. I think by my immigrant parents, I'm not suggesting that Italian immigrants face the worst uh, uh, racism, but they did certainly in the 40s and 50s and 60s and even the turn of the century. And every, gener and every community has. I think of South Asians, uh, you know, young high university students today were facing this and the Tamils and black community and so many indigenous communities throughout the generations. I mean, this is unfortunately the norm. But the question is, do we aspire for a better country? 
Do we want to respect each other even for our differences? And do we have some common identity, some common values that so, bring so, us together? And I'm, and I'm imploring us, for, we cannot be a society of silos, of diasporas. All the Italians sit there and the Portuguese there and the black community sits here and the Indo community here's there. And like, that's not a country. We're well, just I, like, we become like a peppering of communities that sort of coexist-ish. We need fundamental values to unite us. And I, I believe democracy, freedom, human rights, that's been Canada's heritage, uh, where we've really punched above our weight. And if people knew that, I think they'd be proud of that story. Sorry. How do you teach tolerance? How do you, how do you inculcate that pluralism? And one of your responsibilities as Minister yes. of Education has been, as I understand it, to direct, order, prod, push a number of school boards to deal with racism that manifested right. itself, Islamophobia, thinking of the Peel School Board, for example. They have to come up with new policies. Mm -hmm. but how do you teach pluralism, pluralism to students? How do you teach um, tolerance to educators and administrators who aren't doing a good job of it? Yeah, um, it's important. It's a very, it's, it's a bit of an abstract question because we're teaching values fundamentally. We're trying to think what are the tactics to deliver on this strategic imperative of how to make people be respectful of each other. You, you don't have to, you, we don't have to agree, but we should be able to be civil to each other. I mean, that's what I think Canada has historically been about, and we're imperfect, but I think we're generally good at that. Um, look, I mean, in one of the early moves I made in, in, in when I was appointed, I took over to school board. I'm the first minister of education in Canadian history to have literally supervised, which means over, over, uh, took over all the authority of a school board on the basis of anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. There was, a, there was Islamophobia in that school board, uh, among other challenges. That was unprecedented nationally. It's ever been done. The only time a minister has exercised that authority is either because of interpersonal dysfunctions of school board trustees or financial. But you, you had know, to act. Uh, well, you had to do. Something. I mean, I, I think a responsible government had to act. Remember, this issue was 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 common for many years before our government came to mm -hmm. power, and no, yep. and, the, and the minister they didn't act. So it requires political will. But yes, you should. In the abstract, they should have acted, and we did act. We did it immediately and swiftly and decisively, without apology, to send a signal culturally that the leaders, the directors, the school board, the trustees, the staff, the teachers, who we entrust so many parents and trust with responsibility, that they would be zero tolerance. And then we worked on curriculum reforms and professional development, and we leveraged communities who have lived experiences that I don't have, that perhaps you know, others may not have, but we leveraged those communities to come in and teach to kids. Um, and that's why we made civics education and a variety of other additions, like called the Moral Holocaust, et cetera, some of the historical edition. Um, we really profiled that because we're trying to help universalize knowledge around our history to help build a better future. And I think it's a multitude of actions from the student to the uh, staff member, but there's a recognition too. I mean, a lot of values, they don't start in the schools, they start at home. Absolutely, you can't, so, you can't solve everything. Let me, let me just throw, I wanna throw it to the, class, to the students in, in, in half a second, but I do have two quick questions, quick answers. Okay. Um, I see you kind of bobbing and weaving, not that politicians ever do this, but I see you kind of bobbing and weaving in a kind of strategic and tactical way on cell phones. On the one yeah. hand, you kind of convey, I'm gonna to torture you a little bit. Bobby, on the one hand, you kind of yeah. convey that, yeah, we gotta get cell phones under control, gotta do something. Parents love hearing that, voters. On the other hand, it seems like there's a recognition you can't actually do very much because it's complicated. You can't take right. away cell phones. You, you, you said you didn't like TikTok, but you, but you haven't stopped TikTok because you can, right? So cell phones, yes or no, what are you gonna do? Well, I want to go back to your first principle. This is not question period, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but good try. Um, no, I, look, I, I think it's a, a, maybe if I may t attempt to broaden the question of the use of Absolutely. technology and how it interfaces with <clears throat> democracy, we'll bring it back to the, to the democracy forum. But look, cell phones in the abstract, you know, have been an incredibly... And you're addicted to your cell phone, by the way, from what I'm I, Well, I, I probably have a lot of screen time. Exhibit A. But uh, yeah, and I have more than one, but... Um, but where, but where are you going to land on this? Like, I've heard, I've heard your rhetoric on this. What are you going to do about cell phones? Well, I mean, because Toronto school trustees are talking a lot about it right now. Right. So I think I would say it's not as much like the rhetoric. It's just it's accepting that there's a problem. Like the problem definition is there are distractions in schools that are undermining the learning quality, and that's not an opinion of the minister. It's opinion of the educator who shared that with me that there are problems keeping students focused on the subject matter. And we're talking about younger children. 
grade six, seven, eight, nine, ten, where cell phones are now becoming common to see. It's but we all know. Grade 10. You got to tell us where, where, where are you going to land on this? Because because you've you've allowed teachers to, I want, to do it, and it's I, hard for them to do this on the road. I want democracy to speak, and I want to listen to the parents, <laughs> the students. How good was that politician answer, Bart? Um, democracy and action. No, look, I mean, I posed, a, I, def, I threw out a problem to society. There's a distraction in the classroom. I accepted a premise we need to do something, and I will do something. I'm not going to do it tonight at 7.45 on this program. Come on. You but can I make, assure you, you we will, I know I could make news, but we're going to do it during the day. Okay. Where, where you know, uh, you know like, like sort of this media cycle concept. So we'll start in the morning and we'll work backwards. But the point is, is I am resolved to try to remove, as a, as a matter of practical public policy, it can't be, you know, there can't be absolute bans. I think anyone gets that. Nope. Technology could be used, frankly, sometimes teachers require it as a way to access the, tech, access the curriculum. I've heard the, yeah, on the one hand, on the other hand. OK, I have, I have a quick question for you, because we're sure. not going to get an answer until tomorrow. But, but, the, <laughs> but the, a more serious one, though, is let's just quickly segue to the world of online. You're active on social media. You're on Instagram. You're on Twitter. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the hate and hostility and harm, online harm, yeah. on Twitter? I, I'm guessing you probably tried to engage at the beginning and then Twitter turned. I, I know a lot of you aren't on Twitter, but but right. but Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, it all it all got ugly. How do, and, and and by the way, tangentially, and I mentioned you and other politicians in a column on the weekend, you've also had people come to your home. Never mind online. You've actually had protesters. I think they were anti-vaccine people coming to your home and am ambushing you at home. All of that makes it hard for young people, especially women, to put themselves forward for public life. I mean, I think there's a crisis in democracy, a crisis in leadership right now, because smart people don't want to dumb it down. They don't want to, they don't want to subject themselves to all the torture that you face every day. How do you cope with it? You've grown a thick skin, I assume, but right. discuss. Well, look, I think for some people, it certainly could be a deterrent. I mean, if you're an observer of politics and you're like, let's look at this Leche guy's life, you know, he had protests at his home and he has to walk around with an OPP detail sometimes and, you know, Sure, there are very sometimes severe um, realities of being a public uh, public office holder and a leader, uh, and that responsibility follows the leadership role that you have. So, while I don't really think it is necessarily fair that this happens, it wasn't the tradition in this country. We never saw this. It almost seems like an export of U.S. style mm -hmm. intimidation politics. I don't like that, and I don't like that for young people, for women, and frankly for anyone. It's just wrong. But I'm also a big believer in, um, in not ignoring the experiences that happen. Um, and I've been so, you know, unfortunately, it's so common in, in today's politics that you have to have, either you have it or you will build it, um, a, an inner resolve to just stay focused on what I came here to do. If I allowed Twitter to guide my, you know, my emotion and my sense of focus, I'd be an unmitigated disaster mm -hmm. because every day hashtag fire leche is a reality. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and look like, you know, at first I probably was saddened by it. Now I sort of, you know, whatever, just like next, I got, I got a job to do and I work every day, seven days a week. Like I've got, a, there's too much at stake. There's 2 million kids. You know, the, the future of the country depends on ministers and government leaders and any leader in any sector, public or private to be mission focused, mission critical. So I am, and I've learned, you know, to surround yourself with good people. You, you really, it's hard to decouple the personal from the professional. People always see you, me on CP24, they see the Premier, the Prime Minister, they see, you know, leaders of the opposition, whatever, and it's sort of this, there's this like, I don't know what people, I would, I would I'd love you, to one day focus group, like what, what do you, th you see when you see these <laughs> leaders in ties and formality and flags and so, these state, statesly buildings, and it's like, these are humans, that's, you know, that's a mom, first and foremost, the lady, the, my, my partner in crime over there. Like, that's how people are. And so I think we can't, we have to try to retain some sense of humanity in our politics and in our civil, in our society. We're, I've seen a degradation of it probably the last five years more than ever before. It's a threat. We have to buttress against it. But I wouldn't want people in the room to not, even though that's a huge disincentive, I get it. I still think, you know, with a good support system and being totally mission oriented, you can get into politics and ignore much of the sort of darkness that could happen in this space 
and lean into light. And I feel like for me, I'm not trying to be, you know, all unicorn rainbows, but like, you know, you could literally make a difference at a very young age. You could have massive impact and your ideas could be heard and people could respect hard work and not based on your age, but on your ability. And I was a young person in politics. I had that sense of f concern of ageism will it work against me. And I'm happy that most people judge me on my merit and sort of on the, um, on my ideas. And so that is, I think, my hope is a message of a reminder to you all to not give up in the prospect of politics. Even if it's getting a bit dirty or dark, I still think there's a ton of light and we need good people from different parties to stand up. Okay, so nobody in this room, please do, what is it, hashtag fire leche. Please, please it's be It's probably kind trending on, right now, actually. <laughs> please be kind on, on. On, on social media. Okay. Um, Kareem Bardizi sounded out some of the students, and, and um, um, so just because time is short, we're going to kind of, I'm going to queue up the students if you're willing, otherwise I, I can read out other questions that have been submitted. But um, I, I wanted to go to Ria Sid, who, who had a question, I think, on, yeah, go ahead, Ria. <laughs> Do you want me to read your question? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm going to read your question. Um, given the fact that grade 10 civics and careers is when a lot of youth and students in the province learn about voting and politics. What are some of the things the province is thinking about cutting or changing going forward when thinking about the restructuring of the civics curriculum? Mm. I talked about um, it a little bit, but. Is it Ria? Yeah. Ria. Um, um, so that's a, <coughs> excuse me, very interesting question. So we did revise the civics curriculum. Uh, we brought that in about a year and a half ago, two years ago. and. Um, a couple components have been built into civics and then we added some into the English or the languages curriculum that we just unveiled in September. So in the language curriculum that's net new this September is we've introduced a specific section that deals with critical thinking skills, deductive reasoning and how to really formulate an argument to challenge uh, assumptions and how to really be to do your due diligence as a thoughtful person as a Canadian. Um, we've included new sections in civics that deal with contemporary forms uh, or threats to democracy. One case study that I think is so obvious we talked about is disinformation, misinformation, and how social media, you know, can be a value add for social purposes or maybe even disseminating facts, except when they don't. Um, and we saw this. And look, remember, uh, a new threat that was maybe not very, totally new, but rel relatively new, was the threat of foreign interference in our democracy. You know, I'm sure that, I mean, no doubt that's happened in the past in targeted circumstances in various Western worlds, but it, it, it was, it's now been reported by CSIS. Like, this isn't an opinion of, of the star or the globe or whatever. Like, this is a matter of, like, our, our intelligence agencies have confirmed. That's a legitimate threat when foreign entities could help, could try to uh, influence a political outcome in a sovereign nation. That's a, that's a profound threat. It's, it's just so horrible to see this happening all over the world. So we've now included knowledge that deals with those specific more contemporary experiences that may not have been relevant even 15 years ago. Um, we're trying to use a case study method where young people are able to bring forth ideas in the class to create debate forums where young people have the, build the confidence and the skills of how to orate, how to communicate, how to challenge ideas in a way that is civil where you can have you know, a healthy level of uh, disagreement, but it still permits civil discourse. So there's a lot of new things we've built in because I just felt like, you know, it, it was old, it was disconnected, it wasn't relevant, and it wasn't inspiring people to feel like they can make a difference in their government. And I, I, you know, I'd love to one day get a civics course, maybe I could send you the civics curriculum and you could preview it to the class. It's now public, you could Google it. Um, On the reading list. Okay, excellent, <laughs> thank you. So always, always one step ahead of us. Thank you. And, and, I, and I read it, I read it, I did my homework, I read it as well before coming tonight. I'm gonna jump in and just ask uh, Parsa, and, and when I was a, a student, we studied media literacy, now it's disinformation literacy, which yes. sounds like an oxymoron. Parsa Rezai, Rezai are, you, are you here? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I guess my main question is, with the easy access to a bunch of different AI models now, how will the curriculum change to make sure that students aren't spending 12 years learning something that they can easily access within seconds and mm -hmm. that knowledge can be applied using that model? I think if this is probably one of the most um, pressing issues facing government, governments, um, 
is the rise of, um, of AI, which can be for some a threat or an opportunity. Uh, I'm a believer that if it's channeled productively, there's ethical conduct, um, uh, I actually believe it can be a value add for the country and for an education system to really be sort of the, the pioneering, uh, going where the puck is when it comes to the future of the economy of technology and how all those, and even democracy, how all those things sort of come together. So I think we have to harness the power of AI for productive good. I think the challenge is that it just sort of exploded and I think governments and societies and academia and everyone, parents, I think we're all like almost a, a feeling of being caught off guard. Like, where did this come from and how do we counter it and how do we create a regime that is, that permits ethical use? Because obviously it could be incredibly advantageous for a student or business person, a, a government. Um, so I think for me, it's an open dialogue. I, I'm really still very much uh, seized with the idea that we need to create a national dialogue on AI because of course, you know, it could, it could be uh, incredibly enhancing to research, to innovation, um, to discovery, but it also can supplant, uh, or rather it can replace um, so much intellectual stimulation where young people have literally mastered how to ask a question. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very serious problem. So I, I'd argue two core principles. The first is we should harness it for good. And the second is governments, universities, colleges, and as well as K to 12, the, the publicly funded school system, uh, countrywide need to come up with a system that um, denies any harm that can come from it, or at least creates limits on that. Uh, I think about even just jobs that could be displaced through uh, AI and technology. And again, we've always had these fear, you know, these the concept, even when machinery was in drill, it's going to replace the, the human production. And, you know, there's, we keep innovating, we keep finding ways to, for people to be productive. But um, I, I do fear the future in the absence of government sort of today acting. And so I serve as the Canadian Ministers of Education uh, Council Chair on behalf of the country because education is a provincial responsibility. And frankly, we don't want the feds involved uh, anymore. Just give me my passport in six months, that'd be awesome. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, and they could do with their confidence and we'll focus on ours. And so my point is, we as provincial and territorial ministers are, in my capacity as chair, I want to use that forum to create a, a national dialogue coast to coast to coast on what is the future of AI? How do we integrate it in learning? How do we support educators with it? But how do we come up with an ethical conduct that does not pretty much replace learning, uh, which is what I think many, maybe your friends or certainly some of the professors I've spoken to have suggested they're starting to see an, a, a massive increase. There's a poll that suggests- Time, that Time's up because I've moderated five right. panels already on AI in the last Sorry. couple of years, and we could have an entire hour, obviously, we could. on, on AI. So I, I want to give the other students- number. I want to give the other students the chance. Okay. And, and you, you sort of the cell phone thing though in the meantime, and, we'll, and then we'll do, <laughs> then we'll sort okay. of the AI. Okay, okay. Um, Angus Lee, I see you here. Yeah, you had a question. You had like five questions, but, I, but you had one question that I, that I thought was really interesting about the GTA and affordability for teachers. You wanna, wanna ask yeah. that or pick, pick your question? Okay, so it has been well documented in media that public school employers and school boards are experiencing real challenges recruiting and retaining qualified workers to staff the system, particularly in locations like the GTA, which have been seen significant increases in the cost of living. Will this profession pay the bills of my generation of education workers? Interesting. I mean, yeah. in San Francisco, other big cities where the cost of living and the cost yeah. of housing goes through the roof, suddenly teachers can't afford to live where their students live. Right. So it's, uh, I appreciate the question. I'd be curious to see the other ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're a lot harder. So they get harder and harder. Oh, so could I choose? This is not a democracy, Martin, but okay. Uh, okay, so it's a very important question. I mean, the cost of living is an issue for everyone. Um, and I'll say, you know, I, I was raised with all my aunts being educators, almost, almost all of them. Um, and so with a respect for, uh, for, for what they do, I mean, I think a quality educator can literally transform a life. Uh, conversely, a poor educator could have the opposite effect. So quality in education and, and the concept of merit over union seniority for me, and we talk about ideological differences for me is what matters. Like your qualification as an individual, your capacity to educate and inspire teaching should triumph over your seniority in the union. And we may not agree in this room. Some of you may disagree with that premise, but I believe a meritocracy is what should, certainly what your parents and what any you know, objectively rational person would conclude. It should be the best person for the job full stop. 
uh, with considerations for diversity and making sure you reflect the community, which we have provisioned within our policy. So, but you asked about incomes. So our Ontario teachers are, we do pay them the highest in the country. We are among, amongst the highest paid in Canada. The average is that they're on the sunshine list making just over $100,000. I'm not suggesting people enter education for, for, to create wealth. Uh, certainly, I think the overwhelming majority go into it as a vocation because they believe in the power of public education to change lives. It's an honorable calling and we need good people to pursue it who, have, who pursue excellence every day in their lives. We have now negotiated deals that have permitted, I think in a very healthy way, a wages to keep going up. Uh, that includes education workers, where we sign deals with uh, one of the larger unions, QP, and then of course with pretty much virtually every teacher union in Ontario, with the exception of two, which represents the like 25% of students. So we've done the majority of these in good faith, and, and I assure you, if, if, the, if those entities didn't feel like their, their membership was getting a reasonable deal, they wouldn't have accepted them at a ratio of 80% when they ratified them, or 90% when they ratified them. So um, that is healthy democracy to the expression of the membership saying, yes, this is a good deal for us, it's good for families, and frankly for me, my metric of success is it's good for kids because this child stays in school, and, and certainty and stability is consequential to the health, uh, mental health, and physical and academic success of a child. So, you know, this is a challenge for governments because, you know, we've seen shortages not just in education, like literally there isn't a sector on earth that I can imagine where there aren't acute labor shortages. So I think everyone, public and private sector, are figuring out how do we create a system that, re that gives an incentive to retain the workers. I'm also responsible for childcare. We unveiled a national childcare system that cut childcare fees by 50%. We're building 86,000 spaces. We worked with the federal government, different party, to do what was right for families. I negotiated in that deal on behalf of the province with the federal government, and that has been a material outcome. We just increased wages for the ECEs by 17%. Um, in, in, in the immediately for January 1 of this year. So that so the wage went right, the floor went right up and then we're gonna keep increasing it year over year. So I guess the, what I'm hearing is, this is a challenge for everyone today in today's economy. How do you make enough of an income to be able to have uh, housing dignity, renting, owning, et cetera? Um, and I can assure you in Ontario, when you, at least you compare us to our peers, East and West and certainly the US, which is a dramatic, uh, not a good benchmark because they pay them so much lower, but continentally, we are the leader. So, so you, you raised teacher negotiations. So you had, some, you had a rough ride the first few years. You had a, 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 a tough time with QP. You mentioned QP. You, you, know, you had the Charter of Rights fight controversy. Government backed down, it realized its mistake, and negotiated a deal. You've negotiated deals now with um, elementary school workers, high school, public school mm -hmm. uh, teachers, the majority of, of right. teachers unions, two smaller ones still to go. And you agreed to arbitration for the outstanding issues. So, yep. so how did you go from, what made you go from labor protest and right. confrontation to labor peace? Because there have been strikes in Quebec the last few months and no strikes here. Um, Saskatchewan last week. So how did you see the light? Um, well, I would submit there's a, there is some a consistent in the policy application, the aim of the government uh, then, now, and in the future is to keep kids in school. Uh, I think it's obvious that if we can get voluntary deals negotiated in good faith with the unions is the better option, which we've been able to achieve. And I think what it showed also is a nimbleness of government to, look, we were on a, you know, going back to Angus's question, I mean, we were on a different, we, we didn't agree on wages. I mean, I've said this publicly so I can share it today, like we were, quite a far apart on what you know the, the the unions wanted and what the government could afford to provide or was prepared to provide relative to other public sector workers like nurses etc like we were it's not these aren't done in isolation they're, they're done with a sense of consistency of all other ops or ontario public sector or broader public sector workers in this case but i i wanted um i wanted and i think the government wanted to demonstrate to parents that we're prepared to be as innovative as one can be, drawing or inspired by other sectors of the economy, like we do it for nurses or doctors or transportation workers, where look, unions, government, and the employer, I'm not the employer, everyone thinks I'm the employer, the school board's the employer, but the three of us work together and negotiate up until a date. We negotiate hard. We could, pardon me, add days, we could do all the th things, really push the system to get a resolution on as many items as possible, maybe all of them, which is possible. But in the absence of not getting, let's say, you know, let's say there's three outstanding issues, you know, wages and some other smaller issues, we said, look, we already just in other sectors of the, of the government, 
or 12. It's fair. All parties choose the arbitrator. Like this could not be the most reasonable, fair proposal our government could have tabled. And I thought there'd be enthusiastic thumbs up in support of a concept that, that, uh, that has worked well for workers in the past. And ultimately they came around. I mean, they did. Just, I mean, they, they opposed I, I wanna, it until they wanna, supported it, but, but they did get there. And that's my point. And so sometimes you have to be bold in negotiation to table something because I believe the overwhelming public good was keeping children in school. Uh, and we're achieving that overwhelmingly. And I think a lot of parents, a lot of children, and a lot of teachers are grateful that their kids are in a stable classroom. Time for one more question. Okay. I, I see Katya Wells Green over there. You had a question. We're almost out of time. So yeah. short, short. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you're concerned about the unsafe environment that might pose for mm -hmm. the kids. Um, sure. Yeah, I, just about that. I appreciate that question. I, listen, I, you know, sensitive issues and they're, they're tough, but. I mean, I think what I'd say is, first off, we, we've not made any policy change on the matter, although I have expressed a position that I think a lot of people agree with, uh, that you know, the majority, the overwhelming majority, like I take a step back and think, my, my belief is the overwhelming majority, not, not perfect 100%, but the overwhelming majority of parents love their kids, want to support their kids. Uh, I come from an immigrant family where, um, you know, um, it, it, it can take time to bring families along uh, to realize this is the nature of our country. We live in a modern world. You know, we have to respect differences in the realities of, of, of people today. But I do believe two concepts can coexist. You can protect children from uh, abusive and exploitative circumstances, which the, which the school boards already do today. If there's any, any indication of harm, Educators are very well trained and they're very good at knowing what to do, who to turn to, to you know, appeal to the higher ups and social services to make sure that child is in a safe space. Um, so that principle can exist. You can keep kids safe while also, to the extent humanly possible, empowering parents to know what's going on in their kids' lives. If we want to strengthen legitimacy in our institutions, we cannot pretend that, you know, with respect, the professor knows more than, than I'm mean, speaking, it's a bad example because you're adults, but if you were like 12, that the professor knows more than your parents or legal guardian. And I know that there are exceptions, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm self-aware of what happens, but I just disagree with that premise. I, I, I've, honestly, I know that the other, could be, the other side of the, my position could be offensive for some. I find the opposite a bit offensive too, because it's like, with respect, who are you to tell my, my who are you? You don't, you, you don't know my, my child, you met them three weeks ago, you know, you no doubt care about them, but I wouldn't suggest you have any legal or moral responsibility. Um, and so therefore, I don't want to pretend that the parent should not be involved in the life of their child, be it through curriculum, what the kids are learning, um, and other things that I think are important. So while we have no policy to change, uh, your, I think if you're speaking to Saskatchewan style policies, there, there's been no discussion of that. We have expressed a position when I was asked a specific question that I think parents, to the extent possible, should be empowered to know what's going on in their kids' lives. If we want parents to have confidence in their school system, in their educator, in their principals, then let's democratize what happens in the classroom. Let's not like close it off and be like, no, no, they know better. Honestly, like my parents love me. You know, they 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 care deeply about me, and I know that that may not be the, the example for everyone. But I, I think my parents would have been so deeply offended if, if an individual who has responsibility for five hours a day for like six months, seven months a year suggested that they were going to impose a value system um, over those of the family. So I think we have to respect the difference of opinion on the matter, do so in a way that is civil, but always ensure the safety of children will prevail. And in our schools today, that is very much the case. Kids. Um, know that they can trust their schools, their staff, um, and they use the system when they need to, and I have confidence in it. Thanks, Katya. And, and um, an illustration of the balancing act of 
that is politics. Um, you still should have gone to law school. Your parents would have been uh, probably le yeah. less disappointed. Yeah. A, a quick editorial comment. It's interesting because this progressive conservative government and premier and party were really hostile to updating the sex education curriculum when they were in opposition. And Kathleen Wynne's liberal government tried to update the sex, sex ed curriculum. And it drove me crazy because it, it made no sense what your party's position was. And then when they got in government, they very quietly actually updated the curriculum and went even further, because, not because they're that much more progressive, you're not, but, but that you, 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 the, the world had changed even from three or four years earlier. So it's even more modernized. But they just couldn't admit they were they were doing the right thing. So that's politics, I guess. You're not going to agree, but we're out of time. Yes. I want to thank you. I, thank you. I, for I, that. I, I, I do want to thank you for coming and for for braving TMU. You're always welcome here. A thank thanks you. also to the audience for being so terrific. Thank you all. And uh, merci, Megwich, and over to you, Karim. Thank you, Minister, uh, for enriching us with uh, this dialogue and the ch chance to engage with you on some of these questions that are fundamental to our, our future and our democracy. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, uh, Provost Roberta and John McRitchie, Assistant Vice President, as well as all those on the DAIS team. Tanya Coyle, Angus Lockhart, Viet Vu, Catherine uh, Embergy, and uh, Sam Andre, who helped uh, in various ways with this event. The next Democracy Forum is Friday, uh, February the 2nd, with uh, leader of Canada's NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Um, so you can check out our newsletter and sign up for that. Um, if you're making the future student, we'll take a 10 minute break and come on, uh, come on back um, at, uh, in 10 minutes. And otherwise, uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us today.